Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here. Received a donation with a question about <clears throat> uh, objectivist sexual ethics. And there isn't really an objectivist sexual ethic, but Ayn Rand does have some things to say about it. And I want to read real quick a passage from Objectivism and the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. If I had the lexicon here, I would use that, but I just don't have a copy with me. If you are going to have a response, an emotional response to something, which we're assuming a sexual response is emotional, um, you have to um, have a couple of things. Well, let me read from page 153. What is the connection between feeling and thinking? A feeling or emotion is a response to an object one perceives, such as a man, animal, or event, the object by itself, however, has no power to invoke a feeling in the observer. It can do so only if he supplies two intellectual elements, intellectual, which are necessary conditions of any emotion. First, the person must know in some terms what the object is. Second, the person must evaluate the object. Now let's pause for a minute there. You have to have some idea what it is if you don't have any clue you're like a newborn baby looking at a flash or a blur or a blob. No clue what it is. Um, uh, Hitchens says in one of his speeches that uh, people should have known Richard Nixon was a bad guy by looking at his face. And she said, he, he said, you should no more have to tell people not to vote for Nixon than you have to tell a child not to pet a wasp. You know, it's just something you know. As a matter of fact, children are not afraid of wasps or bees or ants. They have no fear of ants. That's why children will sit in a pile of red ants uh, until they're bitten all over. And they're fascinated by the movement and the crawliness. Uh, so you have to have some context, some basis to evaluate things. If we're talking sex, then when you look at a female or a male or whichever, when you look at someone of the opposite sex or the same sex, whatever. You have to have some evaluation of what's going on there. And as Ayn Rand said in Atlas Shrugged, show me the woman a man sleeps with and I will tell you his sense of life. Because if you evaluate uh, the lowest piece of trash that won't reject anyone as uh, the highest value for you to attain, that certainly says something about your self-esteem and your desires and your goals and maybe the fact that you're blanking out your desires or goals or whatever. So um, here's, here's how I put it, uh, speaking to my friend about it. Now, I'll go on just a minute and elaborate a little bit more about uh, the purely carnal side of it. But uh, speaking to my friend about it, when we saw some girls in short skirts and I was ogling a bit, he said uh, something to the effect that they weren't worth looking at or whatever. And I said, well, if you don't put any value into sex, sex won't have any value for you. And that's true. If, you, if sex is nothing to you, then it will be nothing to you. On the other hand, uh, you can tell that human beings have a, a strictly physical side to the sexual um, situation. Uh, Richard Dawkins talks in his book A Blind Watchmaker about wasps and bees and, and stuff that mate with flowers and how is it that the flower has evolved to trick the wasp or the bee into making it think that it's another wasp or a bee to be mated with. Um, I think it's a type of orchid. And, of course, the creationists say that this couldn't have evolved one piece at a time. It had to have been created outright. There's no other way. But Richard Dawkins points out that you don't have to have something perfectly resembling a bee or a wasp or whatever to trick or fool the wasp. The orchid, in fact, doesn't perfectly resemble it. To a human eye, it's a little bit weird, uh, but to the insect, it's pretty convincing. And Richard Dawkins, point, Dawkins points out pornography for humans 
consists usually of ink printed on a two-dimensional page. Or uh, this was a book written in the 70s, but we could also say video and TV or whatever, internet. But that is very, very different from a live flesh and blood human being. Just a two-dimensional pattern of ink on a page can arouse a person. That's interesting. So there is a carnal side to sex. But, as I said before, if you don't place any value in sex, then it won't have any value for you. And eventually, you'll find that sexual adventures do not lead to happiness, but more likely anxiety uh, and uh, a short-term, unenviable, unvaluable, non-valuable sort of um, joy for the evening or something like that. But it's a damage or a harm to your self-esteem in the long run and in the short run. Altogether, it's a damage or a harm to your self-esteem in your person if you don't place any value in sex. Uh, if you do place value in sex and you, you respond, uh, you, you might still respond to a, a beautiful woman that you have no idea what her personality is. She's walking down the street and we wouldn't be the species we are. We wouldn't be alive and thriving on the planet if just the sight of a, an attractive specimen didn't arouse us. But you have to go further beyond basic hedonism and say not only that you're aroused, but is that a value that you should pursue? Is it something that would do you any good? So ultimately I think we have to say that objectivist ethics, uh, as far as sex goes, say that you should seek your own happiness, you should do it using reason and rationality, and uh, you should value your life and your mind as the basis for how to find happiness. You should think with your head, um, not your head. That will lead you to happiness as far as sex goes. Although, uh, taking a glance at a pretty woman walking down the street certainly does no violence uh, to happiness, does it?